playing with your food. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid stand mixer and attachments. Hello and a huge welcome to you all to the British Library Knowledge Centre and to everybody who's beaming in um, online. It is fantastic to see you here. My name is Polly Russell, I'm the head of the Eccles Centre at the British Library and I'm the founder and curator of the food season and I'm here on stage with my friends, allies, partners in crime, um, Melissa Thompson and Angela Clutton who have been the directors for the food season and this season couldn't have happened without them. Um, those of you who are friends of the food season will know that for the last two years we've had to do the season online. So this is, we're, we're delighted the people who are joining us remotely, but my goodness, just to see bodies in this space is so exciting and to have a whole season about to unfold in person is absolutely thrilling. So what a way to start with the amazing Professor Jessica Harris of High on the Hog fame and Andy Oliver of the Great British Menu fame. I mean, that is a pretty great way to start. Uh, the way the evening is going to roll is that um, Angela is going to say something about the food season coming up. Melissa is going to introduce um, Andy. They're going to be in conversation for about 45 minutes and then we're going to hand over to the audience for questions. So do think of the questions you'd like to ask, whether you're here in person or remote. Um, and I'm just going to talk quickly, very quickly about the food season. I mean, you all know, because you're here, that food is the best topic. In fact, it's probably the only topic. And every year with the food season, we try to, through food tastes and food talks, bring together food obsessives, food experts, food leaders to really explore that subject. And this evening is a fantastic case in point. And before I hand over to Andrew, I just want to do a few thanks. I want to thank, of course, everybody here, you who have all come here, my amazing guest directors. I want to thank the KitchenAid. KitchenAid have been sponsoring the food season for three years, and they've stuck with us through COVID four years, and they stuck through with us through COVID. I want to thank them so much for their support. I want to thank uh, John Fawcett, who's the head of events at the British Library and all the events team. They are the dream team. They have brilliant ideas, they get things done, but they also leave us alone to get on with it, which is just fantastic. <laughs> I want to thank Unique, Unique Media, who we work with to do our some of our digital content, but also our amazing AV team as well. So those are the people I want to thank. I want to invite you all to join us at the end of this because this is the launch of the 2022 food season. Join us all at the end for a glass of wine, please, in the foyer. We'd love to meet you all and talk to you. And I think that is my Rolodex of everything I had to say, so I'm handing over to Angela. Thank you very much, Polly. Um, and Polly's just done a great job of thanking lots of people, but I think we should all do a massive shout out to Polly, who's the founder and the creator of the food season. And... Uh, well, a joy to work with and the intellect and the energy to kind of pull this together is phenomenal. As you will see, if you have a look at our season, all that online, so many events, I think 20, 25 or so events. Definitely not going to talk about them all, but a few things we have at the end of the season. We have Angela Hartnett with Ipsma Shrulevich. Our very own Melissa is in conversation with Ainsley Harriet. Um, we have some guest, um, food season guests here tonight who are taking part in the season, which is fabulous, including Kate Young and Sarah Winman, who are doing an event about food and fiction. Next week, we've got Dan Saladino, who is uh, doing an event inspired by his book, Eating to Extinction, with Jessica Harris, we have tonight. And then we have chocolate next week as well. So loads and loads and loads coming up with a fabulous start tonight. Yes, I mean, this is... <laughs> This is sorry. Oh, sorry. That was what you were saying. I'm like, carry on. And you can tell we were rehearsing that really well. Um, yeah, I mean tonight is just like I'm. I'm really excited about tonight, and it's been amazing. Well, I'm not just saying this. It's been so much fun working with both, with both of you. Um, tonight is everything. Um, I'm going to introduce Andy, who, who 
need, needs like, very little introduction. One of our most exciting, brilliant broadcasters from Great British Menu. Um, and I know very little about fashion, right? But I know a style I'll come when I see one, <laughs> and that is Andy. And, um, and also, yeah, she's got a book coming out next year, which I'm, I'm really excited about. And, um, and her amazing um, documentary, um, which I think you saw on iPlayer, um, The Caribbean with Andy and Makita, which was, you know, I think for, for sort of diaspora and, and like for, for everyone, I think everyone can take something from it. And so I urge you to go and watch it. Um, I think that's it. I think let's get to it. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, Andy Oliver and Dr. Jessica Harris to the stage, please. <laughs> take that one and I'm going to take this, this one. one. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> we are alive, right? <laughs> Gosh, don't worry me so early on into the proceedings, please. Southern Baptist Church. You uh, Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Do I need to just resonate a little more for some response? How are you all? Yeah. Better. Like it. That was much better, better wasn't it? Uh, welcome to the British Library. Welcome to this little chat that I and Jessica are going to have. Mm. I'm very thrilled to be here. Last time Jessica and I met was on a screen at the American Embassy. So we did this, sort of started this conversation, what was it, 10 months ago, something like that? I don't even know when it was. My whole timeline has gone weird with the No one COVID. knows what time it is. It's I have not just no a idea. song title. Yeah, it happened and it was great. That's all I know. Now, um, Dr. Harris, Dr. Jessica B. Harris has written so many books and is an expert of the heart matters, I think. It's kind of interesting when I look at your body of work because I realise that one of the things that really strikes me about what you do is that there's an, a, a, a real truth to it and a real heart truth to it. And I think that's what gives your work such weight and resonance and why it speaks to so many people. Okay. So I'm really thrilled that you're here and I'm really thrilled we're going to have this conversation. Um, I want to start, there's a little bit, this is a beautiful book, Iron Pots and Wooden Spoons, one of Jessica's books. There's an introduction that I want to read before we start talking because I think it kind of gets to the key, the nub of things somewhat. In my mind's eye, there is a crescent a sinuous imaginary line that begins on Mauritania's coast and sweeps downward along Africa's palm-fringed beaches from the buff-coloured sand dunes of Senegal and Mauritania through the lagoons of the Ivory Coast and beyond to Togo, Benin and Nigeria, then down to the forested regions of countries with names like drumbeats, Congo, Gabon, Angola. This same line continues to sweep across the Atlantic, carrying with it music, gesture, speech, dance, joie de vivre, and yes, food. This line is not static, it is mutable, a lifeline, an umbilicus. Its flow has enriched the mother continent, Africa, and the new world. It is a conductor of people and of culture. It has brought to the new world Africa's rhythms, Africa's spirit, and perhaps most pervasively, Africa's food. I think that's a beautiful, powerful bit of writing. There's a, there's a quote on the front of this book that says, one of those rare books that makes clear why food is important and how food helps people understand themselves and their history. How would you say that that works, really? Because people talk a lot about food being a lens through which we can view all sorts of history in ourselves, but what does it really mean? Well, I think, first of all, that book was written more than 30 years ago so that that was a different world. Yeah. But I think that the other thing is that part of that is food connects us. It's the human condition. If we don't eat, we're gonna die. <laughs> it's real simple, it's basic. And for all of the people who you know, get their knickers in a knot about it, um, if you think about food, it is so much a part of us that we really can't separate ourselves from it. So it is, it is our connector. Mm. It is the thing that joins us. It is the thing that keeps us in touch with ourselves, but equally in touch with each other. Because it is, it is a thing that can become a lingua franca. It is a thing that hopefully can make us better than we're currently behaving, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but yeah. 
Yeah. So now I want to go back a little bit because I've just read... Well, actually, I listened to you reading your memoir, My Soul Looks Back. Memoir part one. Sorry? <laughs> memoir part one. Memoir. <laughs> it's a really... I have to say, it's a beautiful book, but honestly, listen to Jessica reading it because I listened to it as I wandered around my house and I was kind of pottering around doing things. You've got such a beautiful voice. You've, got, you've been told this before. But you've got a voice that really resonates and I just found it incredibly comforting and really sort of transporting. Now, you describe yourself as something of a, a zelig. Uh, <laughs> yes. Second yes. half of the 20th century. To what, to what are you alluding, Jessica? When well, you... it's the Woody Allen film. Yeah. Zelig, and, and, you know, Zelig shows up. He is everywhere. He is sort of ubiquitous. And um, I've done that mm. in a funny kind of way. I think I don't remember the passage from, you know, verbatim, but essentially I was in Paris when the buildings were gray before they turned that lovely, you know, sort of warm caramel color that they are now. I was in Bahia when Georges Amado was still writing about... Candomblé and things like that, and actually danced in those Candomblé rings when he was at the ceremony. I um, I met Hurricane Gilbert in Jamaica. Oh, did you? Yes, and in survived. Constant Spring, <laughs> and survived at, at a friend's house. So you know, I like to tell people like I got a little Jamaican cred. <laughs> um, I um, was in New Orleans before Katrina. You know, yeah. when people were there, I knew Ellis Marsalis and all of his sons and his his late wife. Um, I've kind of shown up here and in, there in places that have then become places that people look back at and go, wow, those were the days. It's quite interesting, that stuff, actually, mm -hmm. because people end up asking you questions of like, did you know that it was historical? Mo Obviously, it was just Tuesday. Well, it was Tuesday, think. but I think there was also a little bit of a sensibility of, but it's a special Tuesday. Did it feel special? As some of it felt special. Certainly the New York that the book is about felt mm. special. You, you paint a picture of New York at that time. When is it? When, what time are we talking about? What years are we talking about? I would guess it's the 70s. It's and you describe places like El Faro. And I so... heard the church say amen. Somebody's been. <laughs> <laughs> but so vividly that I can almost taste those dishes. And you do actually throughout your writing, use food right. as a way into memory. Yeah, well, does that make, does that make absolutely, sense? Absolutely, absolutely. It's not just Proust, you know. Yeah. It's, I don't have quite the Madeleine, but, you know, sometimes it's the Caldo Gallego from, uh, yeah. from El Faro. I think that of all of our senses, sight is wonderful and seeing things, but for me, the senses that take me back are taste, but almost more than taste, smell. It's you know, true. And smell and taste are so interconnected that it's probably a little bit of both. But that ability to smell something and have it completely transport you, or to taste something, and you know you're sitting at your grandmother's stove, mm. and you're tasting it, you know, on that tasting spoon or the back of your the back hand. Of your hand. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, I think those are the things that, that carry me. You know, the taste of memory, the mm. scent of memory. So how, how was it to write that memoir for you? Because it, it is, it's very personal. You talk about your relationships with all sorts of extraordinary, it's like incredible cast of people moving <laughs> through the book. You know, there's Nina Simone, Maya Angelou, James Baldwin, your ex-partner, Sam. How was it to delve back into those days and really... Did you re-experience things quite vividly? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, also, I have an extraordinary editor. I don't know that we give our editors due credit. So my editor's name is Kathy Belden, and she was the same editor that did High on the Hog. Right. And so we've only done two books together, High on the Hog and Then My Soul Looks Back. And somehow or other, we have bonded in a way. And that, you know, seemingly free-flowing, you know, expression of my soul took 15 rewrites and a whole lot of tears. Oh, 15. So, <laughs> you know, um, but that was, you know, I trusted Kathy and she trusted me. Yeah. And so she would say, Jessica, don't be so mean-spirited. 
It's like, okay, God, I'll take that out. I won't quite say it that way. You know? But so, you know, so I think that that, that that process was good. And I didn't realize how, really how much that time had formed me until uh, I started looking at it. And I mean, it was such a sort of fecund time. There just seems to have been so many things happening. People writing their books that were going to become massively important throughout mm -hmm. for, for the rest of the world. People doing plays and making music and doing all sorts of incredible things. Do you, is there a sort of responsibility that comes with memoir when, when you're talking about other people and telling your stories in relation to them? How does that work for you? I've already said this once today to, I don't know if Michelle is here, but if she is, she'll remember. Uh, I've quoted uh, Steve Lund Morris a fair amount. Mm -hmm. Steve Lund Morris said, um, you better tell your story well, mm -hmm. because if you lie, it will come to pass. Steve Lund Morris is little Stevie Wonder, for those of you who yeah. didn't get that reference. And so um, I think that's your responsibility in terms of memoir mm. is, you know, I can only tell it from my point of view. But to be true to my point of view so that it, at least that part of the history is there. I mean, I think that, you know, it's sort of like the blind man and the elephant. Everybody grabs onto a different piece of it. Right. So somebody might have been in exactly the same room with a totally different story. But I think if you can find a way to put all the pieces together, then you get the story. But I think, you know, in terms of writing memoir, it's about be true to it. Be true to yourself in it, which is the hard part. And I think that's... And do you think that's a, a, a kind of code for life? Probably. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I feel like that that's something that we have to yeah. kind of maintain and connect to, so whatever we're doing. We'll because... remind ourselves of it, because yeah. I don't think we do enough. I mean, I think we get caught up in, you know, the maelstrom and the strum and drang that is every day, and you don't remember that, hey, this is my life. Mm. I need to not necessarily be in charge of it, because I don't know that I've ever been that, <laughs> but I need to at least be in it. Hmm. And I think that's important. Be truthful to it. C central in the book is your relationship with Sam Floyd. T talk to me a little bit about Sam. And I mean, he is a bright, shining creature. <laughs> yes, he, <laughs> he was indeed. Yes, Sam is no longer with us, yep. but Sam... Um, Samuel Clemens Floyd III, which is a name. fair name, a good name for a fair gentleman, and he was a, a gentleman and a gentle man. Um, we taught at the same you know, institution. We both taught at Queens College. Um, my mother, who was my you know, caretaker and my rock, um, hello moms. Um, uh, <laughs> Hi mom down there. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> Sorry. Sitting next to Polly's mom. She's so like... There are multiple... We, we're much like, to be moms this evening. It's a, but, mom, it's a mom crew. Yeah, there. there's a mom yeah. crew. But I think my mom worked at Queen's College as well. She was a secretary. You know, became an administrator from a secretary. And there was a job opening, and I was doing a graduate year in France. And so she would go and periodically badger Sam. Have you still got that job for my daughter? You know, and there was a whole kind of relationship that they had that involved her. My mother was all of five one at her tallest, and so she would go yapping at his ankles, you know, rocket kind of things like yeah, yeah, absolutely guided missiles, the little Napoleon syndrome. Yes. So mom would do that. So the job was there. I ended up with the job. I started out teaching French, not teaching English. And somehow over, over the course of probably the first two or three years of my teaching the job, we sort of circled around each other, circled around each other, and finally sort of landed in a relationship. Mm. Uh, the thing that was extraordinary about Sam was he was extremely intolerant. He took no tea for the fever, African-American expression. I don't know if it makes sense to anybody else, but if you don't take any tea for the fever, it means you take no guff 
from anyone. No and tea for the fever. Mm -hmm. I've never heard that. That's like an uh, old African American <laughs> totally southernism. Use that. I love it. Yeah, it takes no tea for the fever. Didn't suffer fools gladly or well or often if he had any. So did choice. that make you? Because you were a bit younger than him. I was about fifteen years younger. Than so him. did you feel then with somebody like that, if his gaze was on you and his love was on you, that slightly? I was like, in a kind in of peculiar position. It was, you know, it was. It was what it was, and it was, you know, it was glorious while it was glorious, and then it was what it was when it wasn't. <laughs> um, but, but the thing was that um, because he was so intolerant, in a way, a lot of the people at Queens College sort of like backed off. I mean, he had an astounding intellect, mm. and in fact, um, James Baldwin's sister. Um, told me that had he not predeceased Jimmy, he would have been Jimmy's executor, right. literary and otherwise. So that, and James Baldwin was his best friend. So much of the story is about those relationships. And so that kind of intellectual rigor, mm -hmm. that kind of level of conversation was somewhere very different from what was going on a lot of places in the mm -hmm. 70s and 80s. And then there was a whole lot of other stuff that was parallel because it was New York City. It was the beginning of AIDS in New York City. It was the beginning of, well, it was the middle of this new black renaissance in New mm -hmm. York City, the black arts movement. So you had all of these sort of things rolling and roiling together. And, and it, was, it was an exciting time to be alive. And how did, how did you then, amongst that, you started to write about food and you started to think about the sort of lines that we kind of recognise in your writing now. How did those relationships and that time inform your work, do you Well, think? it's funny because I was actually writing before I met... Well, I mean, not necessarily before I met Sam, but before Sam and I had a relationship. Right. I was the, um, initially the book review editor for Essence. And then by the, I guess, mid, late 70s, I was the travel editor for Essence and doing feature work for them. And so I had met Toni Morrison. I did, I now found out it's probably the second major article that was done on her and it was an in-depth interview um, back in 1970, Lord knows what. Um, and so some of the people I had met in my own way, and then the knowing Sam and through Sam, that entire sort of constellation of folks, um, as a result of knowing Sam, so that uh, sometimes the, the knowledge got squared for, right. for, you know, to a different power right. in that sense. So it was fun. And did, did it, do you think that actually having that... Because it's interesting to me that those things became your everyday life, that kind of intellectual rigour, that kind of working at this kind of level, that's sort of normalised for you. Do you think that is something that pushed your creative thrust? I think it did. I think it did. Um, I'm going to tell a story sort of out of school. Oh, yeah, tell us uh, a story. Uh, one of the members of the, the group was, oh gosh, a lady named Rosa Gee. And Rosa Gee um, wrote what were now sort of categorized as uh, young adult books, but she was, you know, a writer, a real, real sure enough writer. And Rosa was very flirtatious. <laughs> and occasionally she would, you know, find a gentleman that she had an attraction to and bring him home and put him out in the morning because she had to go to work. I have to do my writing, so you exactly. must go home. <laughs> so there you go. So there's all of that kind of stuff that, you know, the writing was... Right, important. The backbeat. It was really almost the heartbeat of their lives in a funny kind of way that I don't know I experienced then. Mm. It's with hindsight mm -hmm. that that writing, that being true to that place and that person is that and was that. And that was the sort of the putomita and the central point yeah. around which everything else worked. So taking it very seriously, taking it very, very seriously. You, you describe a time with um, James Baldwin when you went to stay in France. 
mm -hmm. and it, you, you talk about that, that he would appear mm -hmm. and you'd have dinner and then he would disappear again because he was writing. Absolutely. Because he was writing. Tell me about experiencing James Baldwin writing, Oof. reading to you, please. Um, wow. Uh, the, the book that just became a movie that, uh, last couple of years, uh, If Beale Street Could Talk, um, I was fortunate. Remember now, I am 15 years younger than Sam and 20 to 25 years younger than everybody else. I'm a kid. Yeah. And for all of my talking about them and knowing them, I mean, if, if he came in, he'd say, hi, Jessica, kind of thing. I need to be very particular about reminding people I was the tail and that last little part of the tail <laughs> on the kite of their friendship. Yeah. Okay, we were not calling each other, hey, Ma, what's up to? <laughs> you know, that was not the relationship. I was the kid. I was in the room, you know. Soaking it in. Yes, absolutely. I mean, talking, you know, Hamilton quote, I was in the room when it happened. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I wasn't necessarily central yeah. to the room where it happened. Yeah. So I just need to be clear on that. Yeah. But as a result of the friendship with Sam, I got to spend a week with, with uh, Jimmy, and I did call him Jimmy, in Saint Paul de Vence. And it was, you know, 25, 26, you know, so I'm like, ah, I'm going to <laughs> And um, so I pack all of this stuff and tried to figure out what I, what, what do you bring to James Baldwin as a house gift? Uh, what well, you take? hot sauce. Yeah. <laughs> if in doubt. There you go. <laughs> when in doubt, always bring the hot sauce. So I found these massive bottles of hot sauce, <laughs> you know. Um, as fate would have it, one of them broke in the luggage. Oh my God, of Oh, course. there you go. <laughs> you know, there's nothing to of match course. the thrill of, and they were glass bottles, so they're uh, glass shards, uh, and now everything is covered in hot sauce. So that was a way to enter, <laughs> you know, someone's house. It's like, hello, a little, you know, redolent of, you know, Louisiana red. Mm. Um, Ooh, nice. But yeah, so, um, you know, we had established this, this whole kind of relationship. Um, Baldwin's house, which unfortunately has been torn down. Oh, no. Deep, deep sadness about that. Um, That's terrible. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awful. Careless. Very. Um, but um, he lived downstairs, and the guest sort of rooms were upstairs. And so he would retreat. And you, you know, and it was pre-computer, so you hear a typewriter. Yeah, yeah. you know that ding, ding, ding you know yeah. that sound. So, um, you know, we'd hear him. And then one night he decided he was going to read, and he made popcorn, which I thought was interesting. And made popcorn the old-fashioned way, you know, in a pot in and a, stuff, with not, a lid. not the not the <laughs> microwave. Yeah, um, made popcorn, and we all trooped downstairs. And he read If Beale Street Could Talk, looking dead at me. And I'm like, oh, A little bit scary, no? Very. <laughs> so then, um, you know, and they, what do you think? I'm like, oh, it's awesome. lovely. <laughs> I, that's, I say, I think it's very lovely. It's good. You know, uh, what do you think? I, mean, I think I'm over my depth here. Um, but then about three days later, in the space of that same week, Toni Morrison showed up. Now, what I've subsequently learned is that Toni and Jimmy had a friendship that was based on many things, but they could read each other's work as deep and profound writers. Mm in ways that some of the other people in that group weren't. And there was right, a kind of automatic, I mean, people kind of knew where they parsed out down there, everybody else on the end of the thing. But um, he made popcorn again. He read the book again, looking this time to Tony. Right. And at the end of it, she didn't go into a, a long, in-depth thing, but she said, yes, you got it. I didn't realize until that moment, it's written from the point of view of a young woman right. who was my age, which is why he was looking at me. 
which was exactly why he was looking at me. And why he wanted to know something. And why he wanted, you know, he wanted to, I, I didn't know enough to say that. But Tony said it. And when she said it, it's like, oh, oh yeah, I get it now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can say this now. You know, but it was too late. So, yeah. But I mean, but, but that what was an extraordinary, an extraordinary experience. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and I had, because I had known Tony from that article that I had done, I knew that she was meticulous. I interviewed her right after the bluest eye. She just finished Sula. Wow. That's how long ago that was. Um, and I remember we were in her office in Random House because she was an editor as well as a writer. So she would edit at Random House, then go upstairs to Knopf and be edited. But she was um, parsing out or reminding how she had parsed out the first sentences in Sula. Right. In the beginning of Sula, they're tearing down the African-American community to build a golf course. Right. And I remember her saying, they tore down the blackberries and the brambles. And she was a, such a thoughtful writer that she had decided the blackberries for the sweetness of life and the brambles for the pain. For the thorns and, and the thorny things. But that was already there in the subtext of that writing to that degree. That kind of detail. Absolutely. That's why her writing has... That's why her writing that's is what it is. Why it makes us feel the way that exactly. it makes us feel. Now, I want to go back to food because, okay. you know, we associate you completely with food. There are moments in all of your books, your cookbooks aren't just cookbooks, there's a moment in uh, My Soul Looks Back, moments in My Soul Looks Back, where you're describing food in such a way that I literally feel like I'm there. There's a meal that you had with Georges Gahan. <laughs> yes. And I am like, I can smell the truffle, this the incredible... The ragout de truffe, it was a truffle stew. Yes. Oh, my yeah. word. I mean, I, I found it so transporting. Thank you. Is that important to you? I think it is. I mean, I think it's how I experience things. I mean, that was, it was a meal that I had once. It was a meal that I had, at this point, probably 45 years ago. I love that you can remember it in such detail. I am um, blessed slash cursed with that. I mean, it's my, I have my father's memory. And my father was very much self-taught, but he had the ability, which is a pretty extraordinary thing, and I've inherited some of it, to call up what he needed exactly at the moment he needed it. So it's not just food with you? Not always. It can go sometimes beyond food. But that, that meal came back full, you know, full blown from Athena's left ear. It was, you know, there it was. That, I was there, I wasn't meal. even there. Yeah, and you know, it was, and I, I, there are no notes, there was nothing. I mean, I did do a little kind of prep. I went online and sort of looked up Chez Garin mm. and sort of said, okay, but that only thing I learned from that pretty much was that there was a, um, he was noted for those little, what I call vegetable infanticide, you know, those little teeny tiny vegetables, the nouvelle cuisine. <laughs> You know, so. I'm very interested, actually, because you describe yourself as a Francophile and you lived there and you had this extraordinary culinary experiences with French food. Uh, we are living at a time, you know, it's 2022. Is that what it yeah. is? That's, That's what they tell us. I don't know. So they tell us it's 2022. But we're living at a time where the conversation is starting to change around culinary excellence. And I wonder what you feel about the hierarchy of culinary appreciation in that the French cuisine is held as the gold standard still to this day in 2022. And I feel like societally and in our culinary world that other people are still trying to not catch up, but still trying to make room. Should there be more room at the table now? Oh, good God, yes. Oh, there's no question. I mean, I think that, that this kind of Oh, you said hierarchy. Mm. All of those archies, patriarchy, you know. All, those all of those archies need to go. <laughs> um, That's a good uh, t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, the archies need to go. Mm. I think that, um, I think some of that is what we, and when I say we, I'm talking about African-Americans and 
African people in diaspora, particularly in the American hemisphere, um, need to rear up on our hind legs and say, hello, mm. hello. I've been there, done that, doing it, still, good. Um, I think that one of the things that happens is we can become our own worst enemies. One of the things that I am kind of blathering about, and hopefully somebody will take me up on it, is you have to name it to claim it. Mm -hmm. You know, part of why we are so involved in French food is because they've done an awful lot of codifying. Yeah. You know, the la rousse gastronomique, if it's made with green grapes, it's a la florentine, if it's this, yeah. it's that, it's blah, blah, blah. The mother sauce. Yeah, yeah, you can put complete. anything on a plate and call it jerk. <laughs> you can, because we have not defined it. Mm. It's true, and I really wish people would stop doing that. Probably. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> it's really a lot to take. Yeah, it, it, it's, you know, but we need to define our own food. Mm. And do, but do we also need to value? Well, first of all, we need to value it. But part of that is, I think, defining it. The complexities of jerk steamed over smoke. Um, but not just any smoke, steamed over allspice. Although when I was last in Jamaica, they told me all those allspice trees didn't exist very much anymore, and it was now steamed over logwood. So I don't know where this allspice is that everybody's getting. But that's another story. <laughs> that's an entirely another story. That's another story. Um, but, but that, you know, what, what, what is that? You know, what is Escovich? You know, well, and why and how? And why? And, you know, well, I, I did little research on that, and it's from Escaveche. Escaveche. And it, from Portuguese. Escaveche comes from Skibish, which is Persian. Right. A oh, vinegared thing. So we've got now the Persian through the, um, you know, the Almohad, Almoravids, all of those folks in Spain. Then the Spanish taking it as Escaveche, and then it becomes Escaveche. Mm. So we've got all of that history in there that means it's cooked a specific way, that means that there is history and technique that comes with it. And we don't talk about that. Mm. It's just like... Well, it, it's, I think we take it for granted. I feel like we, there's so much skill involved in like, the, the, the cooking from the African diaspora. It's, and it's all, also very, very different. You know, we're still living at a time where people call Caribbean food Jamaican food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the food of every island is different. You know, we look at your Hello. books here. Yeah. Look up yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And um, how, how do you think we start to shift that kind of paradigm? Well, because I think we start... Well, there's, first of all, I'm working on something. Oh, that you need to, anybody who knows me knows to be afraid when I say I'm working on something. <laughs> I have spent the past two and a half years helming a committee for the Culinary Institute of America. And come fall of 2020, they will be beginning a concentration in the food of Africa and its diaspora Amazing. in the Americas. That's and fantastic. Thank you. And one of, one of the things about that that was so extraordinary is because this is a place that is deeply embedded in and invested in, you know, la cuisine française, um, is that the instructors were gobsmacked at the technical complexity of some of this food. Uh, somebody was teaching in Jeddah, mm -hmm. you know, the Ethiopian in Jeddah. And like fermented. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the complexity of the fermentation of the, the grain, of the how you spread it, how, they were like, oh, Wait, y'all got some techniques too. It's like, yeah, guess hey, what? We do, we there's do. A, there's a lot of skill. In a world. lot of skill, a lot of things that people don't really think through. And we don't give ourselves credit because we're so used to not getting credit mm. that we don't give ourselves credit for the things that we do. Um, and, and certainly in terms of food, because of the kinds of foods that we had to survive on, the techniques, in many cases, took primacy of place mm -hmm. because the techniques were the only things that could make it something else. 
turn the alchemy that something better the exactly magic happen. the proverbial you know silk purse out of the sow's yeah. ear I'm, I'm quite interested in i'm going to move to high on the hog briefly but i'm quite interested in some of the like there's that wonderful uh, woman cooking on there gabrielle etienne mm -hmm. who is like trying to really move things forward like she makes a smoke i know i talked about this last time we were talking it's because i'm obsessed by the smoked beetroot cornbread okay <laughs> It's haunting me. The smoked beetroot cornbread is haunting me. But I, I was, it, it really led me to thinking about how when you're cooking dishes that ha have a kind of history mm -hmm. and you start to move things on, you make it your own and you, you kind of want to change things up, people really don't like it. No, they don't. They get, you know. Why, why do you think, what is it we're hanging on to? I think, I think change terrifies folks. But I also think that we are not necessarily approaching the change. I don't want smoked beetroot cornbread. Only. With my collard greens, you know, on New Year's Day. You want I want my mama's cornbread yeah. on New Year's Day. But if you go to Gabrielle's but house. But if I go to Gabrielle's and I'm at one of her things, then that's fine. Mm. But I think that the whole idea is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think in some cases, everybody's in such a hurry to get to the, and it's got this, and we've got a little twizzle on the top, <laughs> and there's a cherry, and it's like, you don't need all of that stuff. Yeah. You know, sometimes the basic thing was pretty darn good. So do you think that comes back again to, like, trusting in the value of the original? I think so. I think there is a very real large need for self-trust. You know, understanding that it's not only okay, it's very, very good. Mm -hmm. And that's all it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be a turducken. If you know what a turducken is, it's a Louisiana Isn't that thing. It's a kind of turkey and a with turkey 17. stuffed with a dust, duck stuffed with a ham. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. I don't like that stuff. Yeah. No. Well, who does? But some that's, weird people like it. Well, that would be in Louisiana. the world that I let's, work in. They not, like the seven. Let's seven not go. Yeah. No. 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 I mean, but the whole the whole idea is, yeah. we are, I think, generally, attracted by complexity. And sometimes simplicity is the thing. Is, and actually, when you let something shine and let it be in and of itself, mm -hmm. that's where the beauty yep, lies. Exactly. But then I, I'm also, it leads me to think that actually, you know, you, you mentioned it yourself. When, we, when people were, when loads of these dishes that we're talking about, this, I, the ideas, you know, the basic di dishes that we see at the, at the heart of kind of African diasporic cooking, uh, when these things were being invented, it, there was real imagination a real creativity there. So I also feel that the modern chef who's cooking in this area is honoring that spirit. I think a lot of them are. I think a lot of them absolutely are. I mean, and, and particularly when they do things like they go back to old recipes, when they look at um, new ingredients mm. or new old ingredients. Mm. You know, those, those things that grandma might have used that you're not using because can't find, don't know, never thought about it. But that sort of retour aux sources, the return to the sources, is, is a very interesting way of, of making things happen. Mm. And I think that there are a growing number of young chefs, not just in the States, but certainly throughout the Caribbean, on the African continent as well, in London, in the UK, um, in France, mm -hmm. who are looking at taking the traditions and, and melding them and, and, you know, and bending them and, and reshaping them, not into something that is unrecognizable, mm -hmm but something that is an extension of what came before. And I think that's wonderful. And it's some, there's something in there, isn't there, about connecting yourself <laughs> to that history and allowing Absolutely. that history to speak through, through you. you. Through you, exactly. Which is a beautiful thing. Now, before we... I'm aware that I'm supposed to ask for you... I just need to ask one more question, OK? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
High on the Hog 2. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about High on the Hog 2. What's, what's that? When's it happening? Uh, How's it happening? It's getting ready to start. I mean, we're getting ready to, in the next month or so, a month or two, start shooting. Have you been amazed at the response to the first? <laughs> Staggered. Absolutely staggered. I mean, and I think one of the things that people don't realize, but it's part of why I'm personally so staggered, is the book is 11 years old. Well, yeah. You know, it's like, okay, it, it, you know, it, it, it was born and it kind of died a morning, and <laughs> then it was there and it was on the shelf. I had 200 copies unsold in my office at oh, Queens gosh. College. You know, now I've got first editions, uh, you know, um, hardbacks, you know, so, but I mean, so, but, yes, thank you. But I mean, but, you know, that was, they were, it was, they've been sitting there for a long time. It's, a, it's an extraordinary book. The Netflix series is absolutely incredible. We spoke a little bit before we came on about you suddenly becoming so visible and that transition. So do you think that's going to get even more tricky to I, it's a navigate? It's a slippery slope. You know, it's a peculiar place. I mean, and, and I think at, at my age, and I'm not going to tell everyone, <laughs> unless you pride me hard, um, but um, I'm used to being me a certain way in the world. And it's very interesting to be kind of, pushed out to be me a different way in the world. It's like, what? You know, I'm not sure I'm ready for this. Well, um, we're all very grateful that you are being pushed out. And we're really, it's so beautiful to have you here. Um, I'm you. assuming there are people out there who have questions. I know I've got to stop talking. Well, obviously that's not going to happen, but <laughs> <laughs> on my own. Are there any questions from the lovely audience? There we are, I have a couple over here. Who's got the microphone? Check one, two, one. someone two. walking upstairs. Yes, there they come. Here we go. Oh, beautiful. Coming at you from both sides. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, it is so lovely. Pleasure to be here. I'm visiting from the States. You hear the accent. Um, I have a question about what you're working on as far as this recognition um, of, of black food ways professionally and um, a recognition of the technique and, and really elevating the public perception of black food ways. With that, there's always a trade-off a little bit. Um, because once you're being taught in culinary school, then you have other people becoming experts in these food ways. And as we know, I'll just say it, when white people get involved in things and are able to call themselves experts in things, they take up all the space in the room. So what can we, I'm a, I'm a home chef that does pop-ups and I'm not quite a real chef, but well, I- Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop, stop, stop I, that now. I will stop, <laughs> I will stop that. Easy. But as a person who loves food and loves sharing food and loves sharing fellowship around food um, and loves doing that in a real black way, how do you counter that space being taken up? Yeah, that's... The How do you, I mean, well, several things. Um, talked about Stevie Wonder before, now I'm gonna talk about Aretha. Um, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. That's what must be demanded. That's what must be given. That's what must happen. The problem is uh, food is to be shared. You can't keep it a black thing, because if you keep it a black thing, everybody be talking about, well, nobody wants to come but black people, and I don't want to, what am I going to do now? It has to be shared. But it has to be shared with respect, and respect must be demanded. Respect must be given. Um, and it must be appropriately priced. Let's, you know, I mean, we start talking about all kinds of things we can get down that rabbit hole known as appropriation. Everybody appropriates. Who made the first omelet? Damned if I know. You know, so we all appropriate. 
the point is Aretha. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Yes, borrow. Borrow as much as you want to. I need to be appropriately paid. I need to be appropriately credited. I need to be in a place that is, you know, appropriate to the food that I am serving at the level at which I want to serve it. And if all of those things are in place, come on, y'all, I want to share. If they're not, then the discussion is different. The discussion is about how do we make those things happen. And that's the important part. Yes, there will be people who claim to be experts in this, but you know, how often I was, where was I? A couple of nights ago, I was in an Indian restaurant. And it's one of the places that I love to go. And I find, I looked at the bottom of the menu and it was like, chef de cuisine, Joe McCarthy. It's like, oh. <laughs> Well, dang, Skippy, you know. So, you know, it's um, how do we deal with that? How do you, you know, and it, it is my, one of my favorite Indian restaurants. <laughs> the entire staff is Indian. But that's the name that it, that now I'm making an assumption that Joe McCarthy is not Indian. He could be. <laughs> so, I mean, so there are all of those things. I mean, we have become such a mix of folks that how are we, and particularly now that we talk about DNA and stuff, how are we gonna take this thread and it's there and that thread and it's there and that thread and it's, what do you do? How do you do that? I don't know. My suggestion would be, uh, and this is a Sam quote, hmm? Sam Floyd quote. Yeah. Sam, when he was rearing up on his hind legs, he used to say, I don't cover much ground, but you better believe I'm covering all the ground I'm standing on. Mm -hmm. Cover the ground you stand on. That's the important thing. I yeah. want to say, add to you, you're a chef. I can tell by the way you speak. So you have to value yourself. And you have to have the confidence in what you're doing. Don't worry about other people. Don't watch them, as they say. Watch yourself mm -hmm. and do what you do with all the heart I can tell you have and all the passion and all the skill and all the knowledge that you have. Just do it the best that you can do it and believe in yourself. Right. And then nobody else can step to you. And cover the ground you stand on, because you do. There's a gentleman there. Oh, he's got a mic already. How did you get that? <laughs> They're holding on to it. Oh, it's not on. I don't think it's working, though. Oh, it is now. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and make this as very quick as possible. From reading your memoir, I know you've been extensively across the Caribbean. And obviously, you spent time with Nina Simone in the Caribbean, in Barbados in particular. And for a long time, she had a relationship with Errol Barrow, of course, who was yeah, the yeah. Prime Minister of Barbados. And anyone that knows anything about him, he was a very, very, very good chef. And I know this is not exclusive to Caribbean culture, but I've asked a few academics this, some of my friends, conversations amongst family members about why are Caribbean men in particular very good cooks? Now, it's not exclusive to that culture in particular, of course, but it's something that's always, 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 always mentioned. And even to this day, people might find this might be, they might find it a sexist thing, but I didn't grow up, I grew up in Britain, but I didn't grow up with this thing that women get in the kitchen. I saw family members tell women, get out of the kitchen, we're controlling this. Like, because, and they would admit no, that most of the time, <laughs> no, no, honestly, most hey, of the time, the men were the better cooks. And that's not me saying it in a boastful way. No, wait, hang it's on. Not, no, 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 wait, I'm sorry, <laughs> okay? All right, you're no, what it is, is that men think they're better cooks, and uh, men, <laughs> men will tell you that they are doing it better because they assume they have the right to take all that space yeah, but there's off two, and, there's, and say there's that's a reason something. why I'm asking less, this. Less confident. There's a reason why I'm asking this in particular. Sorry, I'm not going to shout at you. No, 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 it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> Sorry, you just tickled a little tickle. No, because if I think from an African diasporic point of view, that's the first thing people always come and say to us. And they say that their men don't particularly cook, but there's something about Caribbean men in particular. And two things that normally come up is to do with the matrifocal nature of the culture, because a lot of households are run by women. So instantaneously, 
men learn from the women. <laughs> they think it's also to do partly to do with plantation culture that a lot of women kept their boys close to them because they didn't want to get people to get close to their sons. So it's a particular question. It's not from a sexist point of view. I'm just okay. particularly curious. I'm going to be a why. school teacher here and go, I haven't heard a question yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> What's the question? That why Actually. in particular there is such Caribbean men have so high esteem around cooking and they appreciate it. And a lot in a lot of people see Caribbean men as, as very good cooks. But that's not particularly across the diaspora. It's in the Caribbean that's seen a lot. Still no question. Oh. <laughs> I have I, something I, to I, say I, about I, it. Can I say something? You say and then I'll So go. my dad was a really good cook. But he was a really good cook. I mean, my mum is sitting right here. I can see her smiling while you're talking. <laughs> my dad was a really great cook, but he was a really good, like, celebration cook. So every single pot would get used. The whole house would be turned upside down. The food would be amazing, but we had to clean it up. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I think that Carib a lot of the time, Caribbean men will take that sense of occasion. I don't know that it's just Caribbean men. No. <laughs> That's a very good point. I th I'm just thinking about my dad. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, my father couldn't cook a lick. Right. I mean, could not cook a lick. Mm. But um, I also think that there is a kind of gendered cooking in some of the African Atlantic world. Masters of the flame, <laughs> mistress of the stew pot. OK? I think that there is very much that gender divide. But I also think that it is that celebratory thing. It's the, I'm, you know, we're doing hog killing. Yeah. Everything goes. Uh, we're doing whatever. And I have said, it makes French people a little crazy, when Auguste Escoffier went home, he probably expected his wife to have dinner <laughs> on the table. He does. So I think that there is all of that involved in it as well. Who's doing the daily cooking? The every day, oh my lord, it's Tuesday, there are two meals, I've got to be sure that the kids have something for school, and then there's dinner, and who's doing that? And more often than not, Caribbean or not, it's women. It really is. Do you agree? Yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you're, I like you, you're brave. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's Thank you. Good any, discussion. Any other though. questions? So, oh, there's a lady down here, and there's another lady up there. We can come both ways. Can I go? Is it on? Hello, hello. Hi. Um, thank you so, so, so much for Disembodied for voice. Here. I see you, yes. Hi. Sorry, Hi. disembodied voice. I'm actually an African-American born abroad with the most English accent, apparently. It's coming out very English. I don't know what's happening. But um, <laughs> I, I've been trying to fight for soul food in London for a long time. So um, this is wonderful to see it coming together <laughs> um, and to see how, how people, you know, want, want that kind of... Um, history, um, you know, it's the same diaspora that we, we, we miss because it's an ocean, but I feel like it's, it's necessary here. Um, I'm also vegan, um, and I was in America, one in eight African Americans are vegetarian or pescatarian. Um, it's a bit less here, but it's, it's coming. So I was, there's a lot of uh, arguments about whether or not veganism and soul food or veganism can be part of black food, it's black part, like black history, food history. And I was just wondering if you had any, any thoughts on the role of meat in soul food or black cooking or the role of, um, and whether there's space for veganism to kind of have its own lane in that space. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think one of the things that if you start to look at the history of it, if you look at the traditional diets of the continent, and now I'm speaking in, you know, glorious and horrific generalities, but it's plant forward. It's plant forward. So that there is already a history and a deep history. I think, um, I think there's one kind of confusion. I've eaten in a fair number of, of vegan soul food places. My problem is, and I'm going to share this with you because I do that. Um, I like tofu. Why are you trying to tell me it tastes like spare ribs? Yeah. It doesn't. <laughs> it just doesn't. It just doesn't. You know, everybody's trying to say, ooh, that little tofu thing, it tastes just like fried chicken. No, it doesn't. 
That's my problem. I happy eating vegetables, happy eating tofu, happy eating, but I mean, just don't try to make it what it is. And that's that's my only argument. Other than that, I'm happy. So eating. we have a we have a real history. It's just you yeah. know, like I I tell food is vegan. Well, exactly. Says veganism is not right. Not black. Oh, not black. Oh, just school them. Just, I mean, just school yeah. There's them. an idea. There's a there's a like that being vegan is a white thing, and that there's nothing to do with that history. And obviously, if you do the research, you'll very clearly see. But not everyone does that. So how like like, is there a way? Because again, that, I think that's why they do that. This is this is ribs because we. But that's, that's cultural. because things get that's sold back. Yeah. Into into culture, don't they? So right. if you look at seasonality, eating seasonally, this is as old as the hills. It's the only way you ate. <laughs> you, you had no choice because that's what was there. Yeah, right? Seasonality, you know. nose to tail eating, all of these like... Lovely kind buzzwords. Of, yeah, all of these kind of notions are not new ideas, but they are repackaged and sold back in a particular way. So ITAL food has been around for, you know, ever. Nose to tail eating has been around for ever. Don't let anybody tell you how, to be, how you're allowed to be yourself. You know, people will tell you, oh, it's not black. It's, Excuse me? What does that even mean? I, you know, yeah. the narrow ideas about what experiences you're allowed to have, who you're allowed to be, what you're allowed to reach for. Who cares what they think? You keep cooking your... Do meat. what you do. I do not make meat substitutes. I'm a, I'm a vegetable forward person myself. Um, but thank you so much. I agree. And I think that my, my question is really more based on this idea that... Um, Meat has is fundamental to the culture, and I think that that's that's a, that's a uh, something that uh, you know a lot of even in 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 I'm high on the hog. There was a moment when they, did, when they kind of spoke about how it was once a year or once a season or something like that, and they spoke a bit about meat consumption. Well, but hog killing time. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think if you're talking about African American mm -hmm. food and looking at that, you're looking at pre and post emancipation diets you're looking at the increased amount of meat consumption post-emancipation because it represented that thing that you could not have before. So there are all sorts of things that feed into all of those notions. Um, you're also talking certainly pre and immediately post-emancipation about uh, diets of agricultural workers. You would eat that and then get up and go out and plow the back 40, and then come back and, and have lunch and go out and plow the front 40. Mm. And you, you weren't sliding your ever-expanding backside into the seat of your Mercedes to drive three blocks to work. So it was a different kind of thing. You know, laborers' diets are different, of necessity. Because, you know, that's one of the reasons it's interesting when you really look at a a plate of Caribbean mm -hmm. food or African-American food, there's like five different types of carbohydrate. You know, we'll have yam, sweet potato, mm -hmm. cassava, rice, the and Irish brown potato study. on one yeah. plate, right? People are like, what are you doing? And that's what it comes from. It's like people right. needed that carbohydrate to be able to do the work that they had to do. So We're not there anymore, so maybe we should add some more vegetables to our... To our yeah, yeah. Well, I think people are. Well, I, I have to say that there's so many black places I want to go to, African places I want to go to, but they don't do vegan options. So anyone in the room who's a chef? I always do. I will go to Atlanta. Who's, who's, who's booing? Tell, tell, me, tell me where. Who's tell booing? Me where. Tell me where. Uh, but yeah. Are there any more plate? questions? The yeah. lady down here wanted to, and there's another lady here. What time am I meant to stop? Probably five minutes ago. Well, I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> Is it quarter past or now? Oh, God, okay. hey, cheers, lovely. <laughs> oh, okay, I have a few thoughts which I'm hoping to string together into a coherent question. Um, one of the things that I think is something that I'm aware of being a kind of person of the Caribbean diaspora, Granny's Antiguan, um, <laughs> ah. but a lot of people of my, my granny's age, when they arrived in the UK, the first thing, one of the first things that they did was get an allotment or get somewhere that they could grow things that they were familiar with. And one of the things I think, being a person of the diaspora, I'm very aware that if I have children, there'll be one further step removed from a lot of that culture that I've grown up with and a lot of that knowledge I've been blessed to be able to attain from those people, or obtain rather, is 
how important do you think it is for us as people of the Asp African diaspora, people for whom some of the, the ingredients that are central to these dishes that we want to celebrate are not of this place, come with an extra expense at being imported, thinking about things like climate change? How important is it for us as people who are often coming from communities that are agricultural, do have a kind of hand in the land that is producing that food and that common thread with the food linking with the land that you're from, linking with the people around you. How important do you think it is perhaps looking to the future for us as black people, I suppose, to start thinking about also, do we want to be involved in agriculture? What does sustainable food look like for us as a people displaced from where these ingredients grow well, naturally? I don't know what the state of return to farming is in the UK, but there is a very big, very real, very active movement in the States of black farmers returning, or young black people your age returning to the land. There's a gentleman named Matthew Rayford who has just gone back. He is a sixth generation Gullah Geechee person um, vet, went to the Culinary Institute of America, uh, trained as a chef, and then returned to his family farm and is now farming. There are the uh, Peniman sisters who are doing work on farming. Natalie Basile has just come, We Are Each Other's Harvest, all about that need to return to the land. Urban farmers, Malik Yakini in Detroit, doing urban farming, people farming on rooftops. Uh, again, another Jessica project. I am working with the New York Botanical Garden, and we are planting an African-American garden in the Barnsley beds to celebrate and talk about this deep history of African-Americans and an involvement with farming. And so that, that is very much a movement in the States. People uh, are coming together, urban people, and buying land. Buying land with the idea of farming. And so that's, that's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Others? I see waiting here. It's an interesting thought. I, I'm t I, kill a, I kill a cactus. <laughs> Right, I literally can't grow anything, but I think it's a real, there's a, there's a real, it's a really sort of urgent thing. Yes. There's an urgent need for us to reconnect with our food. When we, my friend Kelly's down here, we ran a pub together and we used to work with an allotment just up the road and they would bring us food from the allotment. We had like a little barter system. Mm -hmm. So people could bring, if they had a glut of something, they could bring that and we would swap it out for a lunch or a starter or whatever it was. And there was something, as a cook, there's something so lovely and really Food with gratifying. dirt on it yeah. is good. It's just been yeah, pulled out exactly. of the earth, the smell of it. The taste of the it. The taste of it and the fact that it's just you and that piece of product, you and that courgette, you and that aubergine, whatever it is, and there's nothing else has happened mm -hmm. in between. Right. I think there's something really beautiful about that for all people. And I think people actually are, not just people of the African or Caribbean diaspora, but yeah. actually I think I think as city dwellers, I think it's really important that we all reconnect right. to where our food comes from and how we can access it. I mean, I well, love the idea of the tomato things. can. I don't I don't know if you have those uh, tomato juice cans. Yeah, here. No, they're probably coming in boxes now. But can of dirt on the windowsill with something in it is is important. Just to begin to to make that connection, and, and particularly for children, just to see that it doesn't grow in a little styrofoam box. Absolutely, yeah. and to understand what food is. You know, I've, I've sent a child to the shop to buy me a lettuce and they've come back with a cabbage. Yeah. You know, so it's like food recognition, just <laughs> knowing that children understand what vegetables are, what they look like, you yeah. know, where the meat comes from, where the fish comes from. It's really important, that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I asked you a question, then I started talking. No, it's fine. Um, I think this is working now. I wanted to ask you because you, you're involved in so many different areas. You're involved in food and literature and history. And I wanted to ask what you thought, like how those kind of fit together in terms of tradition and nostalgia, because 
I'm really interested in what you think. Nostalgia and food has a really fond place. I mean, if you want to upset someone, you you dis, you know, you talk about deconstructed apple crumble or something, and they lose their minds. Um, but it has quite a so it's quite a dirty word in in literature or history um, in some ways. Like so, what do you think the ethics of that are? Like, how do you use memory and history? And like that kind of nostalgic fondness for things, and how does it square up for you? Um, well, I certainly use it in in writing. Uh, you know that that's as I said earlier this evening. Sometimes the taste or the memory of the taste is what takes me back to it. I think nostalgia is it is what it is. I mean, and and. If, if ever given the opportunity to go back and actually taste that thing, often you go like, oh, really? Well, mm, that, that's interesting. Um, so nostalgia is of pretty much definition tinged with sort of a, a, a remembered fondness as opposed to necessarily the reality of the thing. So I mean, I think that that can be the danger of nostalgia, the, the going back and, and remembering X or Y or Z fondly. I'm old enough to remember when lettuce was iceberg, period. And you know, I'd love a good iceberg salad, but I don't know that I'm nostalgic for that <laughs> point in time. And a lot of people, particularly who lived through, well, anybody who lived through the early 50s here with rationing still going on, you know, nostalgia is like, well, maybe not. Um, you know, um, 50s in the States was a very limited larder. And we have come so far that I think when we look back, we don't look back with the blinders of that time period we look back from here and don't necessarily see the absolute of there. And I think that's part of, or can be the danger of nostalgia. You know, that it all was so wonderful back then. No, it wasn't, you know, no, it wasn't. Some of it was, some of it wasn't, you know. Yeah, you kind of edit stuff out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, mm, uh, no, it wasn't uh, that good, yeah. There's a really lovely, you touched on it, somebody up there touched on it about fellowship. It was you, lovely cook lady, chef lady. And you were talking, she was talking about fellowship and I was mm -hmm. thinking about um, Gabrielle Etienne again and that mm -hmm. beautiful table and how, and she, she sees fellowship and communing around food as her resistance. Mm -hmm. How important do you think that kind of fellowship is? I, I, so throughout your work, there's moments of these beautiful parties, like just, not necessarily that grand, but just full of so much heart and soul. How important is that? I think that's cardinal. I mean, I think that's, that's the reason. That's the thing we do. I mean, whether it's, you know, three people at a dinner table having dinner, that is fellowship. Um, favorite word is commensality the coming together to commune over food. Mm. I think that's an important thing for all of us. Um, and it, it certainly transcends you know, race and you know, to more extents than not class, certainly gender. But that, that coming together to commune over food is, you know, it's why we're here. It's what, yeah. what makes all of this happen. It's why you do what you do. It's why I do what I do. It's why you do what you do. It's, um, it's that, that thing that allows us to use the food as a vehicle for connection or to cement the connection. And I think that's, that's the beauty of food. It's everything to me. Yeah, absolutely. It's everything to me. Do we have any more questions? On the, oh, yes, Melissa. Oh, there's a couple more up here. Should we go to them first? Or should we go? Oh, you got a mic? Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, yes, um, it's wonderful 
to see you, and um, I've actually ordered a couple of your books while you were speaking. And Goodness, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Worth a, a, run, a run for them if I waited. Um, yeah, I guess I had a couple. Well, I've written. Uh, sorry if I look at my notes because I just wanted to kind of sketch out my question. I have two questions. Um, so you made um, some very interesting points on the interconnectedness of global cultures and ethnicities as people you know, nowadays start to investigate their um, heritage with DNA testing. And we're um, also aware that, you know, a lot of human migration patterns, you know, from the Atlantic world, you know, the triangular movement and um, the Colombian exchange. Um, sorry. You know, there's a lot of movement with mm. food. Um, so I wanted to look at how you spoke of an institution in America, you know, looking at maybe codifying the cuisines, you know, from those movements, you know, in Africa and the diaspora. So I wanted to know um, how you would, do you have any strategy or plans to how you would look at exploring the cultural property of foods of Africa and diaspora nations and the culinary arts? Is that something that you uh, look at doing? It's something I'm deeply interested in. I keep lobbing it out at various audiences, hoping somebody will say, I'll help you with that. <laughs> so far, <laughs> nobody has said anything. Well, I have a project where I'm looking at that very deeply. I've, that was my COVID project, so that's why I was very interested in asking how they would go about doing that. I also... Well, I mean, I think, I think the first thing is something probably just as simple as a lexicon. Okay. Yes. Uh, you know, a guinep in Jamaica is yeah. not a guinep in Trinidad. And, or in Antigua. There you go. And then so, maybe a technical you repertoire, as you said. You know, just, just that. Yeah. You know, what do you call this thing? Yeah. Just to get people from a variety of places, sit them around a the table and say, what do you call that? And then find out the botanical name for yes, it. Yes, that's, that's, that's exactly what we're Because doing. if we don't do that, we don't even know what we're talking about. Yeah, so, so you, you know, spoke so of food being the lingua franca. I think it's very important to have a common language that is spoken. So exactly. We called, need to know what we are, you know, what are, what are we eating? You know, it's a carambola, is it? What do you call it? You know? What do you call pepper yeah. pot? Yeah, exactly. Our pep Antigua pepper pot's got loads of green vegetables. Yeah, well, your pepper pot is Kalalu. Guyanese pepper pot yeah. is... Guyanese got pepper pot has got casuary. Yeah, yeah, it's and so it's, it's all of that. And then there's that whole north-south Jamaican... Yeah. You know, Jamaican southern, and then all of it. Jollof, let's not start. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Jollof is. <laughs> let's not. <laughs> Name for the empire, it's Senegalese. Right. Yeah. Hey, so, <laughs> so it's great to even hear the conversation and, you know, how that sparks it. So, following on from that, I've noticed that there are only 11 countries in the world that have culinary diplomacy programs. America is one of them, United States is one. There are no African or Caribbean nations with culinary diplomacy programs, which would be very great for sort of raising international trade, um, investment in agriculture, food processing, etc. So how do you, like, as an extension of what you may do with the body you're working with, would they look at supporting that perhaps with nations that have food products to export or cuisines that could be given to the world. You know, Thailand, the reason we know Thai food so well, Thailand has a culinary diplomacy program which helped to set up Thai restaurants globally through their ministry. So mm. you can imagine, even as we speak of jollof rice, every nation, you know, we're very competitive about who does it, but even in terms of how, how many places can you even eat it? This is quite an interesting point, though, and because one of the other reasons we know so much about Thai is people started going there. Yeah. People from here Tourism. started going yeah. to Thailand, right. having these life-changing experiences, traveling around, sampling the food and bringing stuff back with them. But part is of that travel ministry, a really important... Travel is yeah. very much an important part. That I mean, ministry, I think... It was part of the strategy to boost tourism was with the restaurants. Of course. Right. So, you know, so it goes like hand what in hand. What are you proposing? Well, I'm... I can maybe speak to you after. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, I mean, for me... I have, I'm a cultural partner of CBAC. You might have heard of CBAC. It was created after Festac in 1977. Mm -hmm. So culinary art is not always looked on as an art form when we look at African art. We may look at you know, the plastic arts, but culinary art is something that really needs to be supported with culinary institutions. You know, here you have the Cordon Bleu or other culinary art schools that could maybe put that as part of the syllabus. But I think it's a ministerial thing that needs to be done with the nations realizing that culinary art is cultural property. It oh, should absolutely. be protected and it should be propagated. Absolutely. And it should be funded. So if you're a Thai person, wherever you are in the world, and you have a restaurant that might be failing, they would come in and look at it. How could they support you? Because it's a part of burnishing their image worldwide that helps their tourism 
Also in Africa, we know, as you spoke of sustainability with food, we have so much agricultural material that a lot of it is a pharmacopoeia. It has medical properties, it has you know, superfood status mm -hmm. that we're not even aware of some of the foods that we could be eating. That is a huge um, resource that can create employment. So are you saying exports. that we need to support it and codify it for ourselves and therefore we could control it? Yeah, I think so. And we also need to look at the whole pipeline from agriculture as well, because before we have food that we're cooking, it's grown somewhere, it's animals, how they're reared. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of things of husbandry and the rights of the animals or, you know, the, the kind of fertilizer you're using. It's a very big thing. I think it's a kind of table needs to be set for nations who are, if you say, I think you need African to set Union. it. Yeah. <laughs> Help. Yeah, we could discuss that. But I think it's, it's just... It's just uh, we're gonna, I'm yeah. going to move on because there's a, there's <laughs> there's a, a few more questions about. and we've only got like nine minutes left and I, I've been doing a lot of chatting. But thank you so much, my love. Who is next? There is another... Oh, this lady down here in the really fantastic red dress that I really want. <laughs> Try fight it. you for it. So it means so much coming from you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you just a, quite a simple but not simple question. I'm a psychologist, so I will go here. Um, what is, if you don't mind sharing, your most evocative food Hi. memory? Um, and ah. why? Oh, goodness. Um... Hmm. What was the question? What is my most evocative food memory? Ah. I, I can start to cry about it. I know that I am never going to have Thanksgiving dinner with my parents again. I don't even try to cook it. I am a Thanksgiving orphan. I wander, I visit other people. It will never be that meal. So I think that's probably certainly one of them. You know, is the, the idea of that. And it's, it's a combination of the things, the individual dishes, the recipes and everything, but it's also, you know, the place, the people, that stuff that you know you're never going to get again. Mm. Thank you. You love markets, don't you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was <laughs> could tell, could you? No, no. Uh, you, uh, in high the whole ankle deep in pig swill is my favourite. Yeah. Like, yes. What is it about a market? Are, you, are we talking to a room full of market lovers? I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I to me They're that's just, just heaven. It's um, it's the Greek agora. You know, I, literally, I was just talking about my mother when my mother died, and she died early in the morning. And I'm an only child, so there was a whole lot of stuff. My father had long predeceased her. I ended up calling a friend and going to the farmer's market. Yeah. Life happens in the market. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is, for me, the place where I go to center myself mm -hmm. because it is that place where things are going on around you and you can be in whatever particular little ugly world vacuum you're in. But you have to be aware that life goes on if you're in the market, mm. as opposed to if you're sitting in your room boohooing by yourself. If you're in the market, you cannot be unaware that there is life. And so I think that's part of my love for markets. Do you have, a, I'm just really interested, do you have a strategy? A market <laughs> shopping strategy? I have a very clear strategy. My strategy is buy it all. But, oh, <laughs> that's my strategy. I have to start at the top. Oh, okay. And I have to go, and I realised, this. my dad used to do it to me, this is what I realised, and he used to drive me crazy, but you start at the top, you don't buy anything. Oh, no, 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 no. You have to go all the way to the Because they could end. be gone by the time you get no, back. No, 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 but if, because if I buy it at the beginning... Well, you've got to carry it. cheaper. Oh, no, I don't care. Oh, I really care. Oh, see. <laughs> I get like, oh, my God, it's 20 feet cheaper. You know, no, no, no. I am, a friend has said to me, you're not a shopper, you're a buyer. Right. I'm a buyer, I'm not a shopper. I'm a real shopper. So if I find it 20p cheaper, I'm gonna buy, buy that too. <laughs> not a problem. Well, I have to, twice because as I, much, because I can't you know. leave the bargain behind. It really gives yeah, me yeah, quite no, a lot no, of No, 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 then I've got twice as much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I just remember carrying like big bags of <laughs> black eyed peas. My dad used to buy black eyed peas, not dried in uh, a bag. The fresh ones? But like in the pod. 
and then we'd have to take them home and pod the peas. Yes. But why do you do this? <laughs> they sell them dried already out of the yes, pods, but, but they're now not as good. They're not as good. And now I'm like, oh. Now you now get, I it. get it. Now you get it. I Absolutely. get it. They're fresh. Yeah, they're, they're fresh. They're different. And they're very different. different. I thought he was completely ridiculous. <laughs> But I get it, and, yeah. it, it, and I, by osmosis, I took all, I learned well, all Wouldn't you be miserable if you got down to the bottom of the market and the only black eyed peas they had were up at the top, we're, we're and by the time you get back up there, they're gone? It's, that it's, would make it's, me crazy. It's absolutely a, a, a risk. Yes. <laughs> it's a high risk activity. Yes, Jessica. no, it's a high no, risk no, activity, no. and I'm aware I'm risk of averse. No, not, not that, I need them all. Risk averse marketing. Mel. Um, you mentioned travel briefly, and um, I'm just curious as to, for someone who has travelled so much and who has friends, I think, on pretty much every continent, what was it like for these last couple of years where you know, like closed borders and, and, and your inability to, to travel, did that, did that do anything? You were all right with it, didn't you? <laughs> uh, still twitching. <coughs> I realised coming here, and this is my first outing, if you will, um, I'm going to be in Europe for three weeks. But I have to see everybody, so I'm not going to be any one place longer than four days. Because I just have, you know, it's, it's connection for me. And the inability to connect with the people who are my world makes me crazy. It was not a good two years. Mm. And I'm single and I'm an only child, and I don't have a lot of family that I talk to. Uh, I, have, <laughs> I have a lot of dear, dear friends who sustain me. And the inability to connect with them, because Zoom does not do it, um, has probably made me crazier than I want to be. Hmm. You know. Hi, Willis. <laughs> That's a friend from um, nursery school. From nursery school. Oh, wow. Yep. Hello. Yep. Amazing. Yep. We've known That's each amazing. other for forever. How beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you.